I'm going to talk about atheism today. Um, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to try to say th something about why atheists are atheists um, and how we can deal with it when we talk to atheists in a personal conversation or in a public debate. That's the topic of this seminar. And I'll try to talk for about maybe 40 minutes and then leave ample room for, uh, for questions and discussion. Okay? All right, so by way of introduction, um, I don't know whether you ever ask Christians why they believe in God. But if you do, um, I found out you hardly ever get any arguments. They don't give arguments for the existence of God. Or sometimes they do, but usually not. Usually they say, you know, I went to church and I felt the presence of God. Or I was reading the Bible and it just seemed true to me. Or I met Jesus. Or I walked through nature and I was so impressed that I thought there, there must be a God. This is what people usually say, not an argument. And I think this applies in general about the most fundamental things we believe. About, say, the equality of men and women. About the fact that there is a world outside of us. Um, that is not something we believe as the result of arguments. It's something, something fundamental. But if that's true, then it's likely that it also applies to the atheist as a hypothesis. It's likely that the atheist doesn't believe that there is no God because of good argument, but for other reasons. Now this was just a hypothesis, and I'm going to, to show today that I think this is actually true. And um, let me say a bit about the evidence that I have used in order to support this claim. So here's my evidence. First, personal conversations with people. So here we have Herman Philipsa, my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, who is Holland's most well-known atheist. I've talked a lot with him and met with many other atheists. Um, and he actually comes up with arguments, but I think with him and with many others, there's something more going on. Here's a book by, edited by Anthony, Louise Anthony, 25 testimonies of atheists. Um, you would expect many arguments against the existence of God in the book, but when you read it, there are virtually none. And then a third piece of evidence is lots of debates that I've watched online. Veritas Forum debates and reasonable faith debates with William Lane Craig. And there as well you see very often atheists are not motivated by arguments. Just one example that I want to give to start with is the famous professor Thomas Nagel. Here's one quote of what he says. I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. So this is remarkable. This is said by a well-known atheist professor. Now you may ask, why should we look at atheists? Why is it relevant? I mean, in many countries, may maybe 5% of the population or so are atheists, right? So why look at atheists? Why is it important at all? Well, let me give three reasons why I think it is important to look at atheists. First, there are a few explicit atheists, but I think there are lots of implicit atheists. They really don't take the idea that there is a God seriously. It's just way too implausible for them. So they wouldn't say they're an atheist, but practically they are. Uh, second, second, in the population in general, the percentage may be low, but at universities it is much higher. So among university professors and students, it's often 35, 40, or 45 percent. So that group is very large and very influential. Um, and a final reason um, I think atheists are important is that we as Christians, we share something important with the atheist, namely the belief that the existence of God or the non-existence of God matters. Like many people, they just don't care whether God exists. It plays no role for them. 
The atheist thinks there is no God and he thinks about it, he argues about it quite often. And that is something we share with the atheist. We, we believe that whether or not God exists is an important and relevant issue. So that's another reason why atheists are important for us. And to mention a further reason, I've watched lots of debates and public conversations and I've noticed that often the conversation is not at what I call not at the right level. So people are talking about arguments for and against the existence of God, but if the atheist is really driven by something else, you can give thousands of arguments, but it won't make a difference. So we need to connect with the atheist at the right level. And the final reason I think why this topic is important um, is that it seems that at least some atheists are sincerely seeking God. Are they trying to find out, well, is there a God? And they don't find any good evidence. But scripture says in Luke, for instance, that if we sincerely seek God, that we will actually find him. So how is this possible? I think that's another reason why it's important to look at atheists. Okay, here we go. I've got about seven or eight motivations. And here's the first one of them. I call it misguided epistemological frameworks. And epistemological just means something like knowledge or belief. It's a misguided idea about knowledge or belief or evidence. The first one is that believing God is rational only if there are good arguments for the existence of God. And I think people like Alvin Plantinga, Nicholas Wolterstorff and other philosophers have shown that that is not the case. There are many things we believe, like that there is, uh, there is a table here, that I had breakfast this morning, um, that, I've, that I'm hungry or that I feel pain in my knee. Lots of things we believe without any arguments and that are completely rational. And if God exists, it is likely that he creates belief in him in us, right? So it can very well be that God, believing God is rational even if there is no good argument for it. Just to be clear, I do think there are very good arguments for the existence of God. Very good ones. I just don't think we need them in order to be rational. So, and here's a, um, a second one. The second misguided idea is that in order to see whether there is God, we should avoid praying, avoid reading the Bible, avoid going to church in order objectively to assess the evidence. Right? So we should not participate in the Christian life to look at it from a distance, and then we can, then we can assess the evidence. Um, here's one example, Daniel Garber, also a philosopher, here's what he says. He says, I may know that if I subject myself to a certain regimen, for instance, engage in religious practices, then eventually I will attain a state in which I will believe in God, and I will believe that my belief is rational. But that isn't good enough. From my present point of view, it looks too much like intentional self-delusion. It's a bit like conspiracy theories. So if you read too much about it, you know, then at a certain point you start believing it. And that's how lots of atheists think about belief. So they want to not pray, not go to church. And I think that as well is misguided. Because the Christian faith says that we are sinful human beings, and the only way to find enough evidence, or a certain kind of evidence, is to actually do it. Go praying, go, go read the Bible, go to church. It is an important way to acquire evidence. So don't avoid those things. But what is needed here? I don't think what is needed here is not primarily arguments for the existence of God, when you talk to the atheist, but explain why these ideas are mistaken. What's wrong with them? I go to the second motivation, and I call it the ideal of an independent thinker. And I think this one is very pervasive. Many atheists feel attracted to the idea um, of being an independent thinker. They don't want to have any external authority which tells them what to believe or what not to believe. And they think this makes life an example, uh, an adventure, something attractive. So here's one example, uh, Louise Anthony, a philosopher, the one who edited the book. Here's what she says. We atheists have no sacred texts, no authorities with definitive answers to our questions about the nature of morality or the purpose of life. 
no list of commandments that cover every contingency and dilemma. We have no confidence, the evidence of history being as it is, that the truth will win out, or that goodness will triumph in the end. We have no fear of eternal punishment, but no hope either of eternal reward. We have only our ideals and our goals to motivate us, only our sympathy and our intelligence to make us good, and our fellow human beings to help us in time of need. When we speak, we speak for ourselves. We cannot claim inspiration or sanction from the Creator and Lord of the Universe. Right, so she desires to be an independent thinker. Here's one other example, Simon Leyden. Here's what he says. Our existence is this one long walk on a tightrope over a yawning abyss and there is nothing to catch should we fall into meaninglessness or isolation or even mere ordinariness. But he says that is exactly what I find so exhilarating about being an atheist. Life is up to us. There are no safety nets. That's a bracing thought and it's also a reason to live. So these people want to be independent thinkers. Now how should we deal with this? Let me mention a couple of things I, I think uh, the way we should deal with this. First I think we should acknowledge that the church has made mistakes in the past about this. There has been dogmatism and the church sometimes has, has even forced people to believe certain things and we should acknowledge that. We have made mistakes. We should be honest. Second, I think we should acknowledge that we have often left the hard work to non-believers. Like even today, there are relatively few evangelicals in the sciences. They are underrepresented. And we should acknowledge it. But then that's not the whole story. I think what we should also do is explain that there is plenty of room to think critically in the Christian tradition. All the major universities in the world were founded by Christians. And we could give examples of philosophers and scientists like Blaise Pascal or Francis Collins, the former director of the Human Genome Project, examples of people who think critically uh, and are Christians. And some of them, like C.S. Lewis or Richard Swinburne, even became a Christian because they thought critically. Um, and then finally, I think we should also mention, also mention the fact that being a completely independent thinker is, an, is a myth. You cannot be a completely independent thinker. Is there anyone in the room who has ever been in Mongolia? Who believes that Mongolia exists? Everyone. Um, is there anyone who has, has been to the moon? No. We still believe the moon exists and we have beliefs about what it looks like. Why is that? Well, we bec because we trust the testimony of others who have been there, who have taken pictures, right? And we trust them. So complete intellectual independence is a myth. We have to rely on others, especially in science. Okay, let's go to another motivation. <coughs> Following a hero or being a hero oneself. Um, I think this one you encounter quite often. So what happens is that atheists read philosophers or scientists like Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher, or Bertrand Russell, the British philosopher, and they feel attracted to them. They admire them because of their courage. But these people are atheists, so they think they need to be atheists too. Or another reason is they think life is harsh. Right? Reality is harsh. There's lots of suffering and we have to face it. We have to be heroes. And in order to illustrate this, let me show you a short video. It's a few fragments. Um, and here Lewis Wolpert uh, from the University College of London is having a debate. And I, try to, I ask you to try to listen carefully to what he says. There's something very interesting going on here. So I don't know whether you've noticed, but <coughs> It seems, at first sight, it seems he, give, uh, he gives arguments against belief in God. Like, you believe it because it makes you happy, it, it results from tool making, and so forth. But when you listen carefully, there is this phrase he uses many times. And if you watch the whole lecture, he uses it 20 times or so. He says, I'm sorry to tell you, I regret to tell you, 
you won't like this, but sorry, I have to tell you. So what is going on? I think what's going on is he is portraying himself as a hero. He's facing harsh reality and he invites us to join him. Join, join me in being a hero. Face harsh reality. Right? So he thinks being a Christian excludes facing reality, excludes being a hero. That's what's going on here. Now what should we do if we encounter this? What we should do I call it Christian hagiography. That is describing the lives of Christians who have been courageous. You can be a hero in a way and be a Christian. So think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer for instance who died, who was executed because because he tried to save the Jews, because he attempted to, or he was involved in a, an attempt to kill Hitler. Surely it's possible to be a hero and a Christian. And I think what we should do is point especially to the person of Christ, the ultimate hero, he who sacrificed himself for the entire world. Right? If anyone is a hero, it is Jesus Christ himself. So if this is what's happening, then we should not only give arguments for the existence of God, we should show what it is to be a Christian and show that it's possible to live a courageous life. Here's another one that can motivate atheists. Disappointing and traumatic experiences. Right? Everyone has those in his life. And of course atheists do too. Here's one example by Shapiro. <coughs> Here's what he says. One day in February 1984, I was driving and listening to a radio news story about David Vetter, otherwise known as the Bubble Boy. The announcer said that he had been born 12 years before with a condition known as severe combined immune deficiency that robbed him of the usual defenses against infectious diseases. Since any infection would prove fatal, David lived in a sterile environment, a plastic bubble. He had no physical contact with any living organism for 12 years, right? And eventually the defense was breached and his doctors had to enter the bubble. David then hugged his mother for the first time and died a short time later, just prompting the news story that day. And Shapiro says when he heard this on the radio, he said something snapped in me and his belief in God completely disappeared. Now, what I want to say is there's something irrational about this, right? We all know that there, there's a lot of suffering in the world. Shapiro had heard about the Holocaust before this experience, of course. We know that there is a lot of suffering. But then there's one particular story that comes close, maybe a family member, a friend, or this one, and something snaps. It's not an argument against the existence of God. And I want to give you another example by showing a video, a video by, um, in which Garrett Hardin is speaking and he is describing a scenario in which he goes, this is an American guy, he's going hunting uh, together with his father. So he's hunting with his father and um, you know he's a young guy, he asks his father a question that he finds fascinating. He's asking this question, where does God come from? And his father becomes angry and says that's not the sort of questions you should ask. And that is a really traumatic experience for this guy. And I think it has influenced the fact that he no longer believes in God, has become an atheist. Now when it comes to disappointing experiences and even traumas, right? How should we deal with that as Christians when we encounter atheists with such experiences? I don't think we should give arguments for the existence of God. Or maybe we could, but that won't do the work. Something more is needed. I compare it like someone having had an elevator accident, right? If you have had an elevator accident, you can, you can say to that person, well, look, look at the statistics. This happens once in a million times. So you can go again into the elevator. There's no risk. Do you think that will help? No, this person has a trauma because of the accident. So what the person needs is therapy and doing things step by step. Same thing, I think, with traumatic experiences. We should not primarily give arguments for the existence of God, but we should take the experience seriously and talk with them and offer some kind of therapy in a way, if that's possible. Here's another motivation for atheism. Caricatures. Caricatures of God or caricatures of belief in God. 
Now, these can be willingly embraced, so people know better. That's possible. It can also be that they don't know better. They sincerely believe this, but they could have known better. And another option is they could not have known better. They just grew up in an environment where they didn't see another example. So what am I thinking of? Well, for instance, the idea that, that Christians act morally because they hope to be rewarded in heaven. Right? That's what some atheists believe. And of course, this is, I mean, this is clearly not true. When I bring my wife a bouquet of flowers, I don't do that because I hope to be rewarded in heaven. I do it because I love my wife. It's a caricature. Um, here's another one. Um, believers think that they are the only ones who have something valuable to say on morality. Or, the whole Bible is meant literally. Every piece of it. So, it conflicts with science. Or, if you're a religious believer, then you cannot think critically. These are all caricatures. I think when, when we encounter this, what we should do is not so much, again, provide arguments, although they are important, but we should provide knowledge about the rich Christian history, the rich Christian intellectual history, um, and um, his, historical evidence, statistical evidence, we should remove this obstacle, remove these caricatures. And then another very important one is, is moral repugnance. So atheists are sometimes atheists because they morally dislike God or believing in God. So Fernando Savate, for instance, a Spanish philosopher, talks about God as the supernatural tyrant whose goodness nobody is allowed to question. There's a lot that they find morally repugnant about God. So, for instance, God chooses a specific people, or God commands atrocities, or God has created hell, or allows hell. There's also, they find morally repugnant about believers, like the sexual policy of the Roman Catholic Church, or the lack of um, freedom to express one's opinion. And I think, that, again, this is something irrational about it. Um, even if it's true that religious believers are immoral, it does not follow that there is no God. There may still be a God. So it's not a reason to believe that there is no God. It's not a good reason for atheism, not a good argument. But it motivates atheists. Um, and again, this is the final fragment of a uh, video that I would like to show. The famous Richard Dawkins. Uh, talks about the Christian faith, and he has moral problems with it, as soon becomes clear. A life for a life, what kind of a morality is that? That is what Richard Dawkins asks. And I think he is serious about this. He is morally repelled by the Christian faith. Um, and he is not the only one. I think there are many of them. Now, how should we deal with this when we encounter this? Um, I think there are many ways, but let me make three suggestions. First, I think what we should do is do careful biblical exegesis. So he mentions Abraham, for instance, and lots of others do. Abraham uh, being asked to sacrifice his son. I've noticed that lots of atheists are actually willing to look at a passage together. So if they have a problem like that, then, then ask them, well, let's take a Bible, let's look at the passage. Let's read it together and see what is truly meant by it. And often reading it carefully reveals something they didn't see or didn't know. Second, I think it's important to explain to them that it's part of the Christian faith that we've been affected by sin and also our moral cognition, our moral beliefs. Um, so it might be the case that our moral beliefs don't, are not always correct, don't actually track reality, whereas an infinite and perfectly good God does. We should be modest about our moral intuitions. And finally, and maybe very importantly, I think what we should do is point out that within the Christian faith there's plenty and plenty of room to ask those moral questions. In the Bible itself, the whole book of Job is one big question. Job is even asking questions to God that we hardly dare to ask ourselves. He's asking questions because he finds what God does immoral. And I think we can do that as Christians and atheists can do that as well. That is allowed in the Christian faith to ask God questions about what he does. Okay, let me go to the final 
motivation that I will discuss more or less extensively. This is maybe the hardest one if you encounter it. I call it unwillingness to surrender one's status or possessions. Well, as you will know, being a Christian often means that we have to go down a road that goes downwards, giving up things that are valuable to us. Status, possessions, um, maybe even friends, um, money, lots of things. So here we have Henry Nouwen who wrote a book on this. He was a professor at Harvard and gave up his position to work with disabled people because he felt that was the calling of the Lord. Right? And Jesus himself says, if anyone to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Um, I think we all realize that this does not only apply to the atheist, this also applies to ourselves. I find it terribly hard myself to give up certain things. So this is something we share with the atheist. It is difficult. It is not an easy thing. But it is something that is required if we want to become a believer in God. And it may be that the atheist is simply not willing to give up certain things. Now what should we do if we encounter this? I think it is difficult because what the atheist needs on the most profound level is conversion. Confessing his sins or her sins, turning around towards God and acknowledging him and acknowledging his or her own status as a finite, sinful human being. How do we do that? Well, I think we should be honest about it, humble, and say it in a sphere of love and respect and pray for that person. But if this is the case, then a hundred thousand arguments are not going to work. Okay, um, I'm, I'll skip one. Um, I've mentioned motivations for atheism. I think there are more. The feeling that religion is losing terrain to science. This is not really an argument against the existence of God, but a feeling. Peer pressure. It's hard to believe in God at the university, for instance, when all your colleagues are atheists. Lots of people believe what most other people believe. Aesthetic repugnance. Um, atheists are often highly educated and when they go to a church the music is not as be beautiful and nice as it is in the concert hall and it can be chaotic. They don't feel at home. Uh, character traits. There's been research recently that shows that many atheists, respectively many atheists, are, um, have autism. So the inability to recognize the intentions of others. Atheists have done a lot of research about belief in God, psychological research. But now believers are doing psychological research on atheism, and it shows very interesting things. And finally, here we have Paul Fitz, who wrote a book, The Faith of the Fathers, in which he argues that many atheists have a distorted relationship with their father. And if this is true, then it may very well color their ideas of who God is. And they might find the idea so repelling that they don't want to believe in God. Okay. Um, well, what does this mean for the rationality of atheism? This is more a philosophical question that I would like to end with. What does this mean? Well, I'm not going to argue this in detail, but Reformed epistemology, that's a certain view in, in philosophy these days, says that belief in God can be rational even if there are no arguments for the existence of God, right? God can cause in us the belief that he exists in the same way as the table causes the belief in me that there is a table by the light reflected on the table. Now, could it be the case that atheism is rational without any arguments? Does the atheist need arguments, yes or no? Well, might th one might think that the atheist does not need arguments. <coughs> and there are three suggestions here. First, one might think, well, it could be a basic intuition. But it, that's hard to see. I believe in the table because it causes me to see the table. I believe in God because God, if he exists, can cause the belief in me. But if there is no God, right, then there's no thing to cause the belief, right, that God does not exist. One might think, well, what about atheistic experiences, like being in a desert or suffering? Isn't that 
isn't that an experience of the non-existence of God? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, what they experience is, is maybe suffering or the harshness of life. To get from that to the conclusion that God does not exist, you need an argument. And finally, one might think the absence, right, basic beliefs about something's absence or non-existence. I know that there is no um, uh, hippo on this table, right? I see that. There is no hippo on this table. I don't need an argument for that. Well, couldn't it be that the atheist just can see that there is no God, right? He just sees it because it's not there in the same way. And my answer would be no, there's no way that's possible. Why not? Well, because I can overview the whole table and that's why I'm sure that there is no hippo. But nobody, no human being can oversee the entire universe and everything that exists and there, therefore conclude that there is no God. We don't have that overview. So it follows that Christian belief can be rational even if there are no arguments. And, and again, I think there are good arguments, just to be clear. We just, don't need, we just don't need them to be rational. The atheist does need arguments. All the motivations I've mentioned, we should take them seriously, but they're, he does need arguments in order to rationally believe in God. Finally, sincerely seeking God. Yes, I think there are some atheists who sincerely seek God and do not find him. Why is that? Well, partly because of these motivations. They have caricatures or they work with misguided frameworks, right? So they avoid prayer and they avoid reading the Bible because they think they need to. And that's why they don't find God, although they seek him in a way. So I think paying attention to those motivations will help them and us when we talk to them. I suppose you will have questions about this, but just in case you don't have any questions, uh, here are some of my questions to you. Um, what do you think these argument, non-argumentative motivations for atheism teach us about life, about ourselves, and about God? What can we learn from them? Um, which ones have you encountered when you talk to atheists? Third, and how did you deal with that on that occasion? How did you respond to it? Uh, fourth, how would you deal with them now? Maybe it's many years ago. Would you do it differently now? And finally, for those philosophically interested, uh, did you find the argument at the end convincing that the atheist needs arguments against the existence of God in order to be rational? Those are questions in case you don't have any. If you have any, then I look very much forward to hearing them. Thank you for your attention. So the question is, when we speak to an atheist and the atheist gives arguments against the existence of God, um, should we put those arguments to the side and try to find out what the underlying motivations are? Um, my answer would be that we need to do both. So remember Lewis Wolpert in the, in the beginning, the video? So he gave an argument. He says, you believe in God because it makes you happy. I think we should tackle that argument. We should take it seriously. However, we also notice this hero ideal behind it. And we should take that seriously as well. Because if we neglect it, then we neglect what motivates him. And what makes it so attractive, what he does. Because the audience was really attracted to what he said. I don't think because of the argument, but because of the ideal of being a hero. So I think we should do both. That's my point. So apologetics should not do merely arguments, but look behind the arguments at the motivations.